Okay, uh, item four is public comment. Uh, before we open public comment, I did want to say that uh, we will be, uh, I believe, the intention here is also to have public comment and discussion uh, and, and accept comments and questions from the public during uh, our main and really only item here at this meeting, the discussion items. So um, I suppose I would encourage folks to hold their, their comments on this until then, but that's not required. So I don't believe we got, got any uh, written public comment on this meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Eric, no, there was no written comment. Okay. Uh, and Ed, is that is that the plan here that we'll be, we'll be taking comments during the item A and B? Uh, Chair Levis, yes. I think that uh, direct comment uh, on the policies as they're being addressed is I think how we wanted to move forward. Very good. So given there is no written public comment, um, we will go ahead and close out item four and move on to item number five, uh, discussion and possible action. Item A is use of force policy review, SOPs 2-52 through SOP 2-55. And I'd like to go ahead and recognize uh, Dr. Cass. Thank you and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, so, as advertised, uh, we're going to review the use force policies tonight, and then the next item will be to review the uh, uh, discipline uh, policy as well. But in reviewing the use of force policies, the, the question should be, are these policies, how well are these policies working? And it's not a quantitative question, or it's, a, it's a quantitative question, it's not a yes, no question. And it doesn't have a, you know, just a simple answer. And so, is it, as it turns out, there's a well-known, you know, number of well-known uh, policy development processes out there, which um, involve formulating a policy, implementing the policy, practicing the policy, reviewing and evaluating its effectiveness, which means analyzing some data, and then modifying the policy based upon the, uh, the data that you get. And so this turns out it's the same. It's the same process essentially as a scientific method, which is that you you create a, a, a hypothesis and then you test that and modify that modify it as necessary. And it's the same process we go through every day in terms of making you know, making our own decisions. So I'd like to share my screen and uh, we can um, look at. Uh, the visual aids that I have. Yeah, you should be able to do that, Dr. Cass. Okay. Um, okay, so this, what you should see in your screen is essentially the, um, an outline of what is the policy development process as well as the, you know, essentially the scientific method for evaluating, uh, a, you know, for identifying a problem, which is uh, the first step, and, <clears throat> and then writing a, essentially a policy that you think is going to address that policy or address that problem. And that includes having a purpose for the policy. That's what you want it to accomplish. So you put it into action by you implement it. You have to train to do that typically. And then you exercise the policy, and when, when you exercise the policy, you get a result, and you use that result then to feed back in uh, to the uh, to look at the policy against uh, what you intended it to do with the action that you just measured and, and the result that you got, and and then you modify the policy. So this really depends upon having, you know, having data available. And I think it's the data that holds the glue, it's the glue that holds the policy together or holds the, uh, the policy development process together. So it's a way to measure the policy effectiveness. And, uh, and I think that's, that's exactly what we're here to do uh, tonight. And, and so uh, that's, uh, that's the process at least for, uh, creating the, um, you know, for the, the, the method in order to actually review a policy. So, um, <clears throat> in addition to that, APD has written um, a policy development process, which 
employs you know the kinds of techniques that I that I just mentioned here, but has a has a way has you know more steps, more ways to um, uh, achieve uh, input and go through a review process. And I just like to briefly go through uh, what uh, what that policy development process is. So <clears throat> what I have here on the screen is uh, the um, uh, policy development process that's taken from the latest version of, uh, of uh, this policy development uh, SOP. Turns out there's about, there's more than 200 SOPs uh, that APD has in play and they're developed according to this and reviewed according to this process. And so, uh, so typically what happens is the, uh, the step one is to essentially either review the policy or to create it and then uh, get it ready, you know, make a determination if it has a mental health component and this is you know, peculiar to this particular kind of policy development. If it, it then goes through the mental health review and advisory committee, review advisory committee. If it doesn't have a mental health component, then it goes to what's labeled here as step two, which is a policy and procedure uh, review unit uh, meeting. And um, typically what happens at these meetings is that uh, it's they're attended by uh, APD representatives who represent various uh, units within APD. The policy is presented by a subject matter expert who um, has who owns the policy essentially. And then what's uh, useful about this or what's happened since the <clears throat> since the CASA came around uh, was that uh, the the CPOA the, the uh, police oversight agency has a seat and uh, on this. Uh, in this policy development process. So we typically attend, or a representative of the, of the agency, as well as representative of the board, typically attends these uh, policy review meetings. Um, when the policy has been reviewed at these meetings, then there's a commentary, pe commentary period, which uh, in this case is shown as 45 days, but it's typically, I believe that uh, it's still subject to um, approval, but it, typically it's been something like 15 days. And that, to, and that is when uh, APD officers are given the policy to make their comments as well. Or <clears throat> public can also comment on that and, and on this, and there's a form available in, uh, on the APD website in order to make public comment on this. After the uh, the comment or during the commentary period, there's review by the uh, by the stakeholders, review by the um, by the agency and, and the department personnel, as I mentioned. Um, if you go down, then there's a, a rewrite or a incorporation of the comments which in, uh, which are put into the policy, and these comments then. <clears throat> Are presented uh, with the you know the revised policy and what it, what is called the policy and procedures review board meeting. At this point, um, there's the board decides if this is in sufficiently good shape to uh, advance to a, a 30 day you know another uh, review stage. And at this uh, during this 30 day review stage, uh, if it's CASA related, it goes off to the DOJ and to the monitor team, and they they can uh, they review it. Uh, if it's not CASA related, then uh, the CPOA board has an opportunity to make recommendations as well on this policy, and then those recommendations end up going to the chief, who ultimately reviews the policy. If the chief, um, if the CPOA board. CPOA board makes the uh, a recommendation to the chief, then the chief is obligated under the CASA to respond to that recommendation. So I just uh, just a few things uh, I'd mention about um, about policies is there's been a lot of work by both the uh, the monitor by their uh, influence on the on the process. Uh, and they've there have been some guidelines created, I think, or there have been su some suggestions made by the monitor as to how policies should should uh, should be uh, trainable and clear so that officers can understand them. And the purpose is to get uh, uh, officers to 
you know, follow the policy with their with the appropriate tools, and then be held accountable uh, by sanction levels and uh, discipline uh, to be sure that they're following the policy. <clears throat> In order to get the right tools, I mean, there's a whole series of training that uh, occurs or is pot potentially occurs depending on the particular policy which uh, in the case of use of force policies as we're considering tonight uh, is, you know, there's extensive uh, peer training which has been developed uh, with the monitor team. Uh, in addition, there are things like uh, crisis intervention training, you know, the tactical and uh, SWAT training, uh, other weapons training that involves the uh, various uh, non-lethal weapons and lethal weapons that uh, are involved in uh, in, uh, in a response to <clears throat> a given situation. So, and then last but not least, there's also de-escalation training. And I think it's a very important aspect of this. And as you'll see, there's de-escalation is a theme uh, within the policy suite that we're gonna talk about. So this gets us to the, um, to the, to the use of force policies that we're gonna look at tonight. And I think it's useful now to sort of divide that into, into three uh, area, um, areas. Let's move on, here we go. This gets to be a little bit complicated, but I'll try to go through this so that uh, it's, it's somewhat understandable. And we're gonna focus on essentially the first part of this tonight, because that's the policies that are, that are on, the, uh, on the agenda tonight. But essentially use of force involves preparation before the use of force, uh, the actual exercise of a use of force during a use of force, and then the, you know after a use of force, uh, what you do in terms of investigation and review associated with that use of force. So, if we look at this, I think it's useful then to sort of look at the overall review process and how this feeds in, you know, into the uh, uh, into the use of force policies that we are actually reviewing tonight, because this is this is where uh, incorporating information from uh, a use of force incident, uh, it goes. Uh, it, what I've done here is I've tried to create a, you know, a flow chart that shows information with these black arrows and uh, investigative sort of. Uh, you know, the black arrows are are data <clears throat> essentially, and the and the these heavy red arrows are the investigative information that uh, is developed. So out of a use of force, there's going to be a number of uh, 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 sources of data that, that are developed. And there are the, you know, the APD reports, which are described in the um, SOP 256 and 257. Uh, there's, if, uh, if in these reports, uh, when it, there's an initial assessment uh, made of a use of force incident, and uh, if that assessment is made that this is a serious use of force or an officer involved shooting, then the investigation goes through what's called the multi-agency task force. <clears throat> and the multi-agency task force uh, is, um, is generally uh, a, the, uh, the law enforcement agencies in the, in the area of Bernalillo County uh, Rio Rancho the Police Department, the APD Police Department, of course, the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office, and um, the the head investigator in this multi-agency task force, which is reviewing whether the uh, uh, that a policy once it's been determined to be a serious use of force or an officer involved shooting, the the lead investigator comes from the agency at which the officer was employed who. <clears throat> Is involved in this uh, in this serious use of force. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, if uh, the the MATF, the multi agency task force investigation, determines that there have been criminal activity involved, then that gets passed to the Bernalillo County District Attorney or the appropriate law enforcement agency, and and it leaves the realm of APD investigation. So. Um, so um, if it is a regular uh, use of force, a level two or a level three use of force, and we'll talk about the levels of use of force, uh, then it goes to an IA investigation. 
and this IA investigation, internal affairs investigation, this is governed by SOP 257, and their investigation then develops both, you know, investigative material, which goes to the Force Review Board, and other data, which uh, I think goes into, hopefully it's not a black hole, but in many cases, it seems like uh, that's the case, and it's one of the things that I think needs to be, you know, pointed out and, uh, and worked on in this in this process, but I think there's data that's that's here, and uh, it's up to the uh, to improve the process. I think what we need to do is capture that data in order to, you know, feed it back into the uh, into the policy and into the uh, uh, um, and into modifying the <clears throat> the policy so that we improve it. So um, let me go back. Um, well, let me finish out this. Um, this force review board path. So once an IA investigation has been complete, uh, the force review board meets and they do a further assessment of whether the IA investigation was appropriate or whether the findings were appropriate. They may have different findings. Um, and they, I, the force review board then writes a, uh, a report and, and essentially publishes that. And I mentioned that the CPOA executive director is uh, president uh, force review board meetings as a non-voting member and an observer. <clears throat> so um, let's see, another, I wanna tie up some loose ends here. If an IA investigation, it can result in discipline and the discipline follows this SA, um, SOP 346, which is also on the agenda tonight for review. And Typically now, the discipline uh, is a decision that is made by the newly created post of superintendent. And, uh, but of course, the chief is also uh, always in the picture here. And uh, is, there's, I don't mean to limit the chief's role here by this one simple box, but he's, he has responsibilities uh, throughout this process. So um, anyway, in any case, the discipline decisions are made by someone about if they're if they're termination of an officer, then they have to be made by either the superintendent uh, or the chief of APD. Um, let's go back up to the beginning. And if we look at the SOPs that are involved in a use of force incident, there are the four that we have here, but there's also a whole array of, of uh, uses of force, uh, I'm sorry, uh, related uh, SOPs, and I have a list of those here, which might impact the, um, the, um, the, the use of force depending on what the actual application was. So, I mean, I won't go through the, through the list, but as you can see, it, in, it involves everything from what, uh, you know, SWAT operations uh, use force, on-body recording devices uh, have mentions of use of force. They're, they're very useful in terms of determining actually, you know, the level of force that was used in the, and uh, they're very elucidating in terms of uh, reviewing a case to uh, determine the, uh, you know, responsibility for the actions that occurred. So the, the, the policies that we have here, I, I think the main point is that they, they've, are the primary policies that govern the situation, but they're not the only policies in effect. So um, let's see, I like uh, trying to decide if there's any other comments I'd like to make about this. I would point out that uh, in terms, let's talk about the levels of use of force. There's three levels of use of force and uh, level one use of force is any force that is likely to cause only transitory pain, disorientation, and or discomfort during its application. Um, level two force is a force that causes that causes injury or could be could reasonably be expected to cause injury or results in a complaint of injury, regardless of whether the use of force was intentional or unavoidable. <clears throat> Intent, excuse me. Level three force uh, results in or could reasonably result in serious physical injury, hospitalization, or death, regardless of whether the use of force was unintentional or unavoidable. And I might add that it also in this uh, level uh, three uh, definition, 
It includes a critical firearm discharge, police service dog bites, certain multiple applications of electronic control weapons, multiple baton strikes, level two use of force against a handcuffed individual, and certain uses of the uh, pit maneuver, which is uh, a pursuit intervention technique uh, when uh, 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 the uh, pursued uh, car is uh, is uh, caused to stop by uh, you know, being uh, moved uh, moved aside by a by a, a maneuver called a pit maneuver. So. Um, So back to this, if it's a level two or level three use of force, then IA investigates these uh, uses of force. If it's a level one use of force, which are you know, the less serious uses of force without injury, then these, can be in, these are investigated by the line organizations. So I think uh, that is, oh, so one last thing, and that may be that in, in terms of where the CPOA uh, board review process is. It's important to us that uh, we have a role in this in this review of any of these uses of force that go through come out of the force review board. And this is by the ordinance that created the CPOA and the CASA, which is also uh, you know defines uh, many of the responsibilities of the CPOA. So um, I. I think, let's see, I want to make sure I've covered all of the, all the aspects of that. But um, I think that if, if there's any questions along the way, we're certainly open to answering these questions. And I think, you know, public comment may be the time when that, you know, when that happens best. But in any case, we've invited APD representatives to be uh, present to participate in tonight's, tonight's meeting to answer questions that uh, the, you, the public, might have. But in order to keep this process order, orderly, we're going to ask that the public comment questions be directed to, uh, I, we haven't quite uh, worked this out yet, but it can either be myself or board chair uh, Levis if he chooses to field questions and pass those along. Uh, otherwise, if, uh, if he'd rather, I can do this as well. Um, and then we'd like to ask that, uh, that APD be, be available here to answer the questions. We're not going to ask them to make a presentation, but we would like them you know, to uh, be here to listen and uh, to you, the public, and then answer your questions as well when that's appropriate. So um, I've also created a, a slide for each of the policies that we have. It, it at least lays out the policy, the purpose, and the uh, um, and the policy itself. And so um, this is the first policy on the list, SOP 252. It's a general use of force policy. I won't read you the purpose of the policy, but if this is a good place to start, I think we're, we can now open this up to uh, public comment. Unless there's some questions first before we, uh, we, before we have public comment. We have... Um a raised hand from Peter Simonson. So let me elevate him so that he can be seen and speak if I can find him here on the list. And then he can uh, Let's see, where is he? There we go. So Peter Simonson should be joining us. Go ahead and unmute yourself, sir. Good evening, uh, members of the commission. Peter Simonson, I'm the executive director with uh, the ACLU of New Mexico. I'm also, um, uh, our organization is a member of the APD Forward Coalition and happy to have an opportunity to just um, offer some thoughts about the general use of force policy. I, I personally have not had a chance to look at the other policies, so it's just the first one that I'll be able to comment on. Um, I, I know that we have some other members that may also be offering some comments. Um, I'll just try to be brief. 
you know, we, uh, APD Forward um, has been in this process since the very beginning. I think we have reviewed um, every iteration of this use of force policy since uh, it went under, it's been under revision <clears throat> since going back to you in 2015, I think. And I always um, remembered this to be, uh, or thought of this to be a pretty progressive use of force policy, um, all things considered and compared to what we see nationally. Um, but uh, one of our members who may speak tonight as well, Robbie Heckman, one of our steering committee members, um, did the uh, graciously did the work of um, of actually uh, identifying some other policies, um, well drafted policies and departments around the country. And um, this evening, as I was sort of comparing APD's policy against some of those policies, particularly Camden. New Jersey's policy and Boston's policy, I was struck by how deficient APD's policy is overall. Um, and just um, to give you a couple of thoughts of some of the things that re really stood out to me about uh, APD's general use of force policy versus, for example, Camden's, you know, the APD policy really reads as a list of do's and don'ts rather than as a set of principles that guide the department's approach to use of force and the, the, the kind of logic that unites each of the requirements under each of those various principles so that, you know, so that the, the policy sort of hangs together as a coherent whole with a set of principles that officers can yeah. come to understand. Yep, sorry, go ahead. My fault, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead, Peter. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I would just really strongly encourage the CPOA board to take a look at that Camden policy, and we can provide a copy of, of it if you'd like, because it's really quite a remarkable document. Um, and I, and I, I, the, the contrast with APD's policy is really striking. Um, I think one of the things that uh, one of our members may also raise is, you know, one place where it's the difference is really obvious is in the sanctity of life statement at the outset of the policy. Um, you know, frankly, we have in the APD policy a pretty lackluster uh, commitment to protect the sanctity of human life. In fact, I'm not even sure that we use that, that APD uses that language. Um, but again, if you look at the Camden policy, you know, it sets out in a series of paragraphs, actually, that the primary purpose of this directive is to ensure officers respect the sanctity of life when making decisions regarding use of force. And then it goes into depth about what that commitment actually means. With the APD policy, you have a single sentence that says, sworn, policy, sworn personnel shall make every effort to preserve the sanctity of human life in all situations. Um, I won't go into detail. We'll be submitting um, written comments on some of these issues. But, you know, use of force prohibitions, um, the, the the next section in the APD policy, a number of places where we do not recognize prohibitions that are recognized in other policies, for example, prohibitions on using force to resolve a situation more quickly, to punish a person or retaliate against them for past conduct, um, to, to uh, or based on bias against the person's um, perceived race or ethnicity, so on and so forth. Also, no prohibition on using flashlights as impact weapons. APD, um, in its distant past, has a history of having um, uh, seen incidents, a, series, a pattern of incidents uh, of that nature. Use of force procedures. Um, you know, there are also a series of uh, requirements that I think could be really helpful to the policy. The, while the policy does require that uh, sworn personnel verbally identify themselves um, and announce their intent to detain or search or so on and so forth, you know, there's not a requirement that those that that self identification actually be clear and audible to the person receiving it. Um, we don't see in this policy um, a continuum of the kinds of resistors that an individual officer might encounter when they uh, consider the use of force. And one of the really great things about the Camden policy is it provides the officer with a continuum of, um, 
of different levels of resistance and the appropriate level of force that can be applied or should be applied in those various circumstances. So that the officer is sort of given this roadmap for saying, well, is this a cooperative person? Is this an active resistor? Is this a person who is actively violent and are trying to harm me? And therefore, what are the appropriate um, use of force responses? Um, the duty to intervene section in the policy, um, I don't know, and perhaps the CPOA members can tell me whether or not the duty to intervene appears in another part of APD's policy. I just tried to do a quick scan to see if it shows up anywhere else. Um, if this is the only place in this general use of force policy where a duty to intervene is cited, um, it's a pretty deficient um, a requirement. It just simply says, uh, um, when feasible, any on-scene on officer who observes another officer using force that a reasonable for, uh, officer would view as out of policy under the circumstances shall, when in a position to do so, safely intercede to stop the officer's actions. Um, you know, take a look at the Camden policy and you'll see what a truly well-developed Duty, duty to intervene policy looks like. And I just might add that recently the advisory, uh, the policing advisory task force of the National uh, Council on Criminal Justice just came out with a series of five um, priority recommendations that it makes for uh, improving policing and reducing police violence um, nationally. And one of those five is actually a robust duty to intervene a policy and training program. Um, so it's, in my view, it's really imperative that we see APD implement something of that nature. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, and thank you for giving me so much time to, um, to present. The last thing I'll just say is, you know, it really is striking when you compare this policy to other policies around the country, how frequently the requirements on officers are qualified by the statement when feasible, officers are required to do this, that, or the other thing. Um, that's not something you see uh, repeated so often in other policies. And here it, it, it occurs, and it probably occurs a dozen or more times in this policy. And it's, it almost gives the suggestion that, like, to do these things, to de-escalate, to intervene, to require that the office that you know to ensure that people get medical assistance if they've been the subject of uh, the victim of use of force um you know they, it's almost like you get extra credit if you do these things but it's not really an expectation you know it's like in the best of all circumstances try to do these things but we know that it's not always going to be feasible and i just think that language really sort of um, dilutes the impact of the requirements that we're trying to um, uh, put on officers to ensure that they use force responsibly, um, uh, to use it proportionately to the circumstances that they find themselves in, um, and that they make every effort to de-escalate situations. So I'll, I'll stop there. And again, thank you for such an um, extended period of time to comment. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Simonson. Next, we'll go to in Maestas, or I'm sorry, Elaine Maestas, go ahead. Hello, can you all hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So um, first, I would just like to thank you all for giving us the opportunity um, to provide our input. My name is Elaine Maestas. I am um, a police accountability strategist with the ACLU of New Mexico, and I am also a member of the APD Forward Coalition. Um, and I just want to thank Peter. I think he did a great job on highlighting um, APD Forward's um, comments and concerns. Um, so APD Forward is actively working right now on a thorough review of these policies, um, and we plan on submitting our findings to you all as soon as possible. <clears throat> So when reviewing um, implemented policies across the country, we came across Camden PD's policies, as Peter had stated. And I really want to emphasize that we highly recommend that the CPOA and APD's um, policy procedure and review subcommittee review Camden PD's policies that have been implemented and followed um, and that um, 
they recommend changes that reflect Camden PD's policies. Um, these policies have led to great successes in that department that we honestly hope to see um, happen here. Um, so I'll provide input now on the revised policies that we are reviewing um, tonight. <clears throat> so there is a reference to the Graham versus um, Connor in 252 that is unnecessary and interjects um, potential confusion regarding the standards required by the SOP um, and APD's policies. So we, we would just suggest the removal of that reference, especially because there is a paragraph that clearly states that the department requires sworn personnel to exercise a higher duty of care than that um, that is set forth in Graham. Um, but we, at, but if this language is um, to be retained, we strongly suggest that in um, the paragraph four be devoted to explaining why and how um, APD aspires to a much higher standard, adding its um, commitments to training and equipping sworn personnel um, to meet to this higher standard. Um, we also recommend that the city and APD uh, make a clear statement in the use of force policy regarding um, the city and APD's commitment to the sanctity of human life, transparency and accountability, and how they will support and train officers accordingly. Um, again, I just wanna thank you all for this opportunity and we will be getting our written um, statements over to you as soon as possible. Thank you, Ms. Maestas. Uh, next, we'll go to Attorney Cronin. Yes, thank you all. Um, I echo the sentiments of Peter and um, Elaine. They took some of the wind out of what I was going to say, but in addition to what they have said, I don't see any prohibition on um, the use of force or a level of use of force on someone who is identified being in a behavioral health crisis and uh, the process of perhaps calling in other professionals, such as that, you know, people associated with the Albuquerque Safety um, Department, um, who would be better off dealing with this situation rather than armed officers. So I think there should be a prohibition on using certain levels of force on people in a behavioral health crisis. And I would urge you to consider doing something regarding that. Thanks, Attorney Cronin. Uh, that's all we have as far as anybody who has raised their hand. Um, and there hasn't been anything submitted in the chat. Director Harness, I think you muted yourself. Yeah, I did, didn't I? Sorry about that. I'm out of practice and went on vacation. Um, we don't have any other persons that have raised their hand and we don't have anything else in the chat. So um, I think that may conclude our comment on 252, unless there's something else. Ed, are the panelists allowed to make comment? Uh, Chair Levis, Member Nixon, of course. It's your meeting. Okay. So thank you um, for your comments, um, uh, uh, Mr. Cronin, um, uh, Ms. Maestas, and make sure I get everybody's name here. <clears throat> One of the things that I've, I've felt in looking at the um, SOPs when I first came on board of the board um, was that I, I, I looked for different phrases such as like protect and serve or something like that. And then in a lot of the SOPs, in fact, I don't, I don't recall finding it, um, that term protect and serve, although it is on the side of the police cars for APD. Um, with what you are saying, and I do have the Camden um, um, use of force policy up and with the first part in the paragraph for purpose uh it says the primary purpose of the directive is to ensure officers respect the sanctity of life when making decisions regarding use of force um 
I don't know if you 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 realize some of the cases that have that have gone down through APD, but what you illustrated in your findings um, also really brought to light uh, the recent case that we looked at. And I, I'm not going to go into detail with it, but it it seems to me that looking at this policy 252. It is void of the sanctity of life, in my opinion. I don't see anything in there. And if, if you see how APD officers in some, in some uh, um, you know, cases handle uh, a suspect that has even been shot uh, after the fact, there is no sanctity of life in that, in that capacity, in that situation. Um, so thank you for bringing that to the attention because... As you can see, the uh, SOP 52-52 uh, needs a lot of work. And in comparison to, to what other cities have done and that paling in comparison, I think that you are generous. Um, this, this policy, in my opinion, uh, reeks of implicit bias and gives a lot of wiggle room uh, to do a lot of harm to the public uh, the way it is written. Um, it's written similar to what I would expect a soldier to be written to before they have to go off to war and, and fight an enemy that's been designated for them. Um, so that's just my opinion on it. Uh, but thank you. I just want to say thank you to the three of you. I believe member French has her head raised. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Simonson. Is he still here? <clears throat> But is he still able to hear us? Yes, hold on. I have okay. to bring him back. I have to bring him back in as a as a panelist. So give me a second. Sorry. Go ahead. Mr. And Mr. Simonson, you were saying Camden, Camden. How how do you spell that? Because I want to look at it also. And then my second question to you is. Something you said, you said you see a lot of do's and don'ts in our SOP or in this, but you don't see principles. Would you elaborate a little bit more on, on that? Sure. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yep, great. Um, yeah, so for example, uh, you know, and not that you don't get, you don't want do's and don'ts in a policy of this kind, but, um, you know, the Camden policy, you know, uh, we also looked at the, um, again, I credit uh, Robbie Heckman for, for doing the background work on this, but Robbie was also able to find the Boston and the Las Vegas Metro policies, and they have similar, um, some similar, um, you know, good, uh, I think, great uh, aspects to them. But, you know, for example, the Camden policy in particular is organized around a set of core principles. So, for example, um, one principle is officers may use force only to accomplish specific law enforcement objectives. And then and after that, you have a set of um, requirements that sort of accomplishes that core principle. The second core principle is whenever feasible, officers should attempt to de-escalate confrontations with the goal of resolving encounters without force. And then after that, you have all these other requirements organized to achieve that principle. Um, and, you know, the APD policy, by contrast, is just sort of organized around a set of do's and don'ts um, without that kind of those kind of organizing principles. Now, I just have to think that if you're an officer, this would be true, um, you know, for a operational policy in our own organization. The policy makes a whole lot more sense, and I would imagine is easier to implement and follow if you're guided by trying to accomplish those bigger principles. Um, and, um, and, you know, it just, it means that the whole policy sort of hangs together naturally and you sort of have a roadmap for recalling what these various requirements are. Whereas with the APD policy, you just kind of have a list of stuff that you have to memorize. And, um, and there's a lot of stuff in there, a, a lot of which is good, um, and a lot of which appears in these other policies, but it's just the way that it's organized that I think makes it harder to assimilate. I, I would imagine it would make it harder to assimilate. Um, you know, I think, I think officers want to know what's the rationale behind these policies, not that they just have 
um, a series of requirements imposed upon them, but that there is a guiding logic to each and every one of those um, sets of requirements. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I just um, I just like to point out that there is a mention of sanctity of life in the use of force policy. It's the first line in the in the uh, in the um, in the policy statement itself, which is that sworn personnel should make every effort to preserve the sanctity of human life in all situations. Whether that's strong enough or not, or whether it's you know it, there's been enough elaboration around that is another question. But there is a there is a statement of that policy. There's also, I'd also like to point out that if you look at the de-escalation policy, there's, there's much more detail in this policy about you know, the process of de-escalation. And so I think, you know, again, this is a, you know, a, partly a case of organization as, as has been pointed out, but there, and, you know, that may become as important as the language itself as to whether it's, it's an understandable policy. Uh, the other the other point I'd like to make is that even with you know the proper mentions of these things, ultimately it depends to a great extent on the training and the ability to change the culture at uh, in any organization to get the kind of behavior that the policy dictates or or uh, is used as guidance for. So. While the policy itself, you know, needs work, we also, I think, need to pay attention to what, you know, what comes after the policy is developed, after the policy is written. How do we get, how do we actually implement that policy? And that, that involves training. And then, of course, in the end, it, it involves, uh, or in the, in the review process, it involves, you know, paying attention to what, it, what we learned from the exercise of that policy and using it to improve the policy. And so I think this, in, you know, in my view, this is, this is one of the deficiencies in the process is the uh, lack of information which is fed back into the policy uh, to modify the policy or the training that uh, is in the, uh, in the policies in order to, um, you know, to get the kind of uh, uh, police, the kind of policing that, uh, that the community wants. So I'll, I'll uh, turn this back over to other commenters. Uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Simonson raised his hand again. I'm not sure if you all can can hear me okay. Um, yeah, I just, uh, you know, uh, the, I just posted a, a Camden's policy. So you have a sense of sort of the disparity between the lengths to which Camden goes to demonstrate that there really is a commitment to preserving the sanctity of life versus APD's statement. Um, it's really quite a remarkable difference, I think. Um, so um, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, yes, and just uh, to direct everyone, uh, Mr. Simonson's comments, the posting is in the Q&A section and not the chat. So if you're looking for that uh, writing, it is in the Q&A section. Uh, member Galloway and then member Nixon. Thank you guys so much. Um, I really appreciate your comments. Dr. Cass, by any chance, because I know you're, you're present at most, if not all, uh, EPRB meetings and policy meetings with APD, do you get a sense that there's an ongoing review of other be best practices 
um, in the country and other departments that are maybe under consent decrees or revamping their use of force policies just as um, betterment? Or is this a review of how things are doing in our own community and really kind of goes no further? I, I think uh, primarily the focus is on uh, the, uh, the policy as practiced within APD. And uh, I, I think it requires a special effort to, um, to expand that, that search outside of, the, uh, outside of the current policy. And I, don't, I haven't seen that happen to any great extent. So I, I think you're, you raise a good point, and I think that this is a, another area that should be, um, um, that we should try to influence APD to look at these other actions. I, in a way, I see that as as more data that should be brought in, brought to bear when it comes to judging or evaluating a policy for its effectiveness. Is how does it how does it compare to other policies and their effectiveness in their in the practice or application of those policies where they where they're applied? <clears throat> now, that's sometimes that's a very hard data to come by, but but in fact, you know. I, I think this is the general deficiency of, of the policy development process is, is looking at the available data that, uh, that either exists here at APD or in other, at other police departments. I think the most immediate and useful data is the data that you collect yourself. But I think there is some, either it's um, inability to retrieve it, inability to analyze it, or, re, or a reluctance to analyze it so, um, and apply it. So I mean, those are just observations, um, but I, you know, I think you've raised a good point. Member Nixon, I think you were next. Yeah, I was in, in, in comparison to the two policies, I, I kind of, I understand what uh, Mr. Simonson was, was saying, but when you, when you look at the uh, policy from Camden, that's, after, right after the table of contents, the first thing that's glaring um, in those purposes is the, um, the sanctity of life statement that was made in versus when we look at the first line of the policy, and that's after purpose, it, it's, it talks about sanctity of life very, very brief. Um, I wouldn't even call it a paragraph, just a couple of sentences. I think I, I, I kind of get, get it. I, I don't know that you can train out um, the hostilities and aggressions um, for certain people, and I wouldn't even fathom how to screen those out. But I think that if we're looking at it from a perspective of preserving human life, um, one is one set for combat and the other one is set to preserve human life in a very tense situation. So I just want to say I see your point. Thank you for pointing that out, Mr. Simonson. Uh, other comments from commenters or, or participants on, on 252, you know, we're still going to work through some of these other uh, really co commingling policies. So uh, there will be further opportunities. But Okay, Dr. Kess, I don't know if you want to uh, proceed with the next policy 253. Uh, so... You know, I, I have a sense that, you know, the response should have been to all of these, any of these four policies. So I guess I'd like to open it up, you know, if or, you know, make the call again, if there anybody has any comment about any of these four policies. Uh, if, uh, if there's a particular policy they want to comment about, I can, I can put it on the screen or I can uh, put the, um, uh, just the summary. But uh, just as a matter of review, uh, and maybe this will you know, stimulate some questions, but as we just saw, we've primarily been talking about the SOP 252, which is the use of force general. Uh, and I mean, I haven't put all of the policy statement itself in this summary. There's, you know, there's, uh, there's several more statements regarding uh, uh, essentially the things around the Graham standard, but, uh, but that's, you know, that's that discussion. So then uh, 253 is simply a policy which defines uh, all of the terminology used in, in, the, other, uh, in the other policies. So uh, especially the use of force policies. 
254 is intermediate weapon systems, and it has to do with um, uh, identifying the uh, intermediate weapon systems which are used by sworn personnel. I, I can read this purpose uh, and uh, establish uniform guidelines for sworn personnel and the use and deployment of those intermediate weapon systems. Um, and so I'll, let me continue. Intermediate weapon systems are less lethal options available to sworn personnel when executing lawful objectives that are designed to produce pain and in incapacitating effects. Intermediate weapon systems are intended to overcome resistance or stop the threatening actions of an individual to control a situation without causing death or serious physical injury. There is always a risk that an intermediate weapon shall cause an unintended or unforeseen injury or death, even when the weapon is used as intended. Sworn personnel must set, well, there's some word, verbiage of exchange, I think this is a typo. They shall exercise restraint in the use of intermediate weapon systems, employing de-escalation techniques whenever possible. So uh, this, you know, this uh, is a, a policy that, like it says, it deals with the other options or the options that are that use non-lethal weapons, which it also points out um, are maybe lethal if uh, you know, in certain situations. So um, uh, let me just complete the suite. Uh, the uh, the fifth one or the SOP two fifty five is the use of force de-escalation policy, and I think this is a you know this is a very important policy uh, that. You know, I would hope that we would have some you know, more discussion about, but let me read the purpose. The purpose is to establish guidelines for sworn personnel of APD uh, regarding the use of de-escalation techniques during interactions with individuals in an effort to avoid unnecessarily escalating a situation to gain voluntary compliance from an uncooperative individual and to reduce or eliminate the need to use force. <clears throat> When feasible, and this is language, of course, it's, you know, it's been raised as somewhat objectionable, but when feasible, when feasible, an officer shall use de-escalation techniques. Policing at times requires an officer to exercise control of a violent or resistant individual or an individual experiencing a mental or behavioral health crisis. At other times, policing may require an officer to serve as a mediator between parties or to defuse a tense situation. So, um, I, I would also point out, this is another case where in observing what is in a policy that, that says that we should, uh, that APD is going, going to strive to use de-escalation techniques, um, it's, it's apparent that you need to be taught these techniques and they need to become second nature in order to be applied. And this, in reviewing some of the use of force cases that we've seen, it's not clear that that's the case. Somewhere there's a breakdown in the process of de-escalation, in my view, and I think it, you know, it needs to be. You can do this anecdotally, or or you can actually analyze a lot of cases and see where de-escalation could have been used, uh, and it wasn't, or it was used successfully. And again, this is a case where the data exists within APD, presumably, but. Uh, seldom in the review of a policy is this, is this kind of data presented to see where it might point out that, yes, there's, you know, we have a de-escalation, you know, uh, statements, we have de-escalation statements in our policy, but we really can't show that, that we've done anything, you know, successful with this uh, or not. I mean, we can't show the positive cases where this is, where this has been in effect or make the corrections where we could have done a better job of de-escalation. Or we, you know, we were missing a technique. We were, we had the wrong people at the uh, at the scene. Uh, you know, those kinds of uh, 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 that kind of data exists. It needs, to, but it needs to be dug out of the, uh, somewhere out of the uh, the data that existed at, um, at APD, and then applied to the to the policy. So, if that if that stimulates any comments from our audience or from the board, I did, you know, I will open the floor back up to comments along those lines. Looks like Director Harness says uh, uh, Robbie Heckman has a hand raised.
sorry, let me get him. Uh, let me get him in for talking. And I also see we have uh, attorney Cronin also has a, a hand raised, so we'll get you. Okay. Next. Yep. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Heckman. Thank you, Director Harness and board members. Um, yeah, with regards to de-escalation 255, I think the one thing that it would benefit from is an explicit statement that de-escalation is not just a technique um, to be used on people who are experiencing a mental health crisis. I think sometimes at APD and in my conversations with officers, they view it as a technique isomorphic or specific to people who are in mental crisis. And I think that, you know, those soft skills that are required to effectively deescalate would benefit almost any situation. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's one point I think. And also if I could just, back up to the, the points er that were made earlier about the, the principles and guiding principles of the department. Um, again, having talked to several officers, field officers, um, I think in addition to those principles, there needs to be a full throated statement that APD uh, shares the mutual accountability. 252 as it's, as it, as it's written now, is again, which was mentioned, is kind of a list of of what what is expected of the officers, and completely silent is APD's full throated commitment to train the officers, support the officers in um, and equipping them and building capacity, identifying, of course, disciplinary situations, but also, uh, I think, as as Dr. Cass is pointing out. Uh, remedial training that may be necessary based on the, it's not all about, you know, discipline. Sometimes there is uh, deficiencies in training that get identified through the practice. Um, so those things, I think that we, the policy would greatly benefit from those, those things as well. And I, I, I really appreciate you guys having the special meeting and the opportunity. And I apologize. I'm going to have to jump off here, but, Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I'll go ahead and recognize Mr. Cronin. Yes, thank you all again. And thank Mr. Heckman for his comments. Um, in section H, um, I appreciate that this is being addressed. Um, I would suggest that the wording an officer should be changed to shall um, as used below. Um, and I'm not sure why these other elements of the policy have been taken out. I think they help explain and direct um, an officer in following um, the policy. And so I, maybe somebody could explain to me why um, the sentence an officer's approach to an individual can influence whether a situation escalates resu resulting in the use of force. An officer shall avoid taking unnecessary actions. An officer shall recognize that the elevated stress levels can have an adverse impact. Um, and when feasible in interaction with individuals, an officer shall use um, advisements, warnings, et cetera. So I'm not, I think those are elements are very helpful. I don't understand why they were, have been taken out. Uh, Mr. Corman, for clarification, which policy are you referring to? I'm at 255. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, uh, sorry. I, I didn't make that clear. That is 255.4, I think. H. Are, 
Is this the area that you're talking about? I, I, it's page five, the middle of page five of the policy? Yes, it is. All right, thank you. So I can, uh, if you permit, I, I, I can read this uh, section and uh, see, let's see. So starting with section H, if an individual is or appears to be in a mental health, mental or behavioral health crisis, an officer should attempt to de-escalate and shall otherwise follow SOP uh, response to behavioral health issues. Let me um, highlight. Right, so my first comment is that should, should be cha changed to shall. And then below that are the sections that have been taken out and I don't understand why. Okay, we can, we can note that. And I, I suspect uh, Commander Evans is also uh, noting the same. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I think those elements help inform um, the sworn officers in why they should do this and adhere to age. I think in reading through this policy earlier, and I don't recall the exact language, but I, I, I was actually a little bit confused when it came to applying the escalation techniques to mental health uh, uh, people or people suffering from a mental health uh, or mental health crisis, whether they were uh, uh, pushing the escalation techniques or, or whether they were uh, not, whether this was uh, it was like, well, we have to pay special attention to somebody in a mental health crisis. Uh, but I, it was like, it was almost like a warning uh, in when I read it at first. I think I had to read it a number of times before I realized that it was intended to apply de-escalation techniques, not be warned that de-escalation, you know, someone in a mental health crisis might be not be receptive to de-escalation techniques. Uh, I think there's some, you know, and I, you know, I don't know if this has an impact on the actual um, you know, practice of the policy, but I think you made a good point that uh, if officers uh, see this as only applying to mental health uh, situations, uh, and I think mental health, and they're not trained in proper responses to mental health issues, then uh, it becomes a, you know, not a very useful technique to have because it, is, it may not be employed, or if it is employed, it may not be employed properly. So uh, thank you for that. I'm wondering if we can recognize someone from, uh, from APD, if there, if there is someone available that wants to, to comment on that question. And then I also see that member Nixon has his hand up after, after that. Sure, I'd, I'd be glad to director um, or chair. Sorry. Um, usually when you see like C one, two and D, when you see those crossed out, it usually means that there was duplication of effort in our policy. So what it, how this reads to me is that uh, we're to refer to SOP response to behavioral health issues, and there's going to be the guidance that we need for those situations within there. Uh, so when you see a removal of something from a certain policy, it's because it was duplicated typically. Um, and should, I mean, it may read different under that policy, under the behavioral health. I haven't pull it, pulled it up. I've still been reading the Camden policy. Um, but uh, usually when we use should or when feasible, as Camden does often throughout their policy, um, I heard someone mention the feasibility uh, statement. Uh, Camden utilizes it uh, about as frequently as we do. It's just uh, written probably uh, a little bit better in certain respects. Um, when you see should, it's just if it's uh, it's not always uh, doable for lack of a better word when you see feasible or should things like that it's it's a recognition of it may not be possible to to do and commander just if i could respond regarding duplication even though the these items might be somewhere in another policy i think it's useful even if it is duplication of the statements that they be included in, in this policy also Uh, also, I wanted to 
mention uh, Robbie Heckman's uh, statement. Uh, uh, I did get a lot out of that, uh, how you, de-escalation shouldn't be utilized as a tool. Um, when I first came on, it was more verbal judo, things like that, um, you know, how to talk to people. Um, and it was a all the time sort of interaction that you had rather than this tool that you utilized. So I, I liked his statement uh, regarding that. And that's something that uh, uh, I'll definitely take away from this or one of the many things. I appreciate that, Commander. Uh, Member Nixon. Yeah, um, I was looking through the uh, definitions and the de-escalation policies. I think it's uh, 253 and 255. And I didn't see anywhere in that policy, and maybe this is a recommendation, where you have a definition of um, de-escalation as well as a definition of escalation. Um, and the reason I say that is because looking at some of the cases I've looked at so far um, and, and serving on this board, uh, this policy may, may as well not even exist. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about the way that I've seen officers time after time talk to um, uh, people who are being stopped, um, people who are being, it, it almost gives you the feeling that uh, they're, they're being criminalized despite the fact that they're not criminals, they're just citizens. And so I understand um, what Commander Evans is saying that sometimes it's just not feasible to do certain things, but I also um, believe that the reinforcement of, of behavior that's expected of your officers, you should take every um, opportunity in, in just in written statement as well as in action to ensure that those those actions help happen. From what I've seen so far, um, and in living in Albuquerque, I don't I don't see anything in these policies that's going to change. Again, is going to change an officer's behavior uh, based on what you see in policy perhaps with disciplinary actions, but when it comes to that, that like I said, that implicit bias, those, those uh, reactions and actions that I've seen time after time, uh, time, after time that are, that are uh, in my opinion, unwarranted. And granted, I haven't walked a mile in their shoes, but just looking at those reactions, it seems that there's a different approach that can be taken, but is not taken. And I wonder if, especially when barking commands, where that lies on the spectrum of escalation versus de-escalation. So that's just one of the things I'm thinking about. I, I, I'd like to recommend is that that escalation definition be be put in as well, so that there's an understanding of the and differentiation between the uh, two, escalation and de-escalation. Thank you. Uh, other comments from. Uh, panelists or board members or, or uh, attendees that, that have comments or questions since we've now opened this up to the, the whole policy suite. I see uh, Vice Chair Galloway and then Elaine Maestas. Thank you, Chair Lemus. Um, and perhaps Dr. Cass, again, because you and I have been through this um, use of force policy um, revision previously, I, I have a very faint recollection of the uh, re repetition in policies, the duplications um, and crossing policies being put in place to kind of reinforce the message that was being conveyed to officers, what we were wanting our officers to, to take away and have it available in multiple places so that they didn't have to cross reference policies and there being some value to that. Dr. Cass, I don't know if you remember that as being part of our conversations a few years ago or not, um, but just to kind of touch on that point, Commander, that there, there may have been reason for that repetition in there. Yeah, and I, I definitely acknowledge that. Um, and I, I believe there are times where it's appropriate. What, what I was running into, especially with our force policy, is um, I think someone mentioned it, <laughs> it read like a to-do list. Um, and uh, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, our, our policy needs a lot of work. Uh, Dr. Cass said, you know, it does. It needs a lot of work. And we do need to feed the, the deficiencies and, and the data back into it to make appropriate changes. Um, what I've run into, um, you know, being on the department as long as I have, 
is um, I remember when the policies were simpler and easy to adhere to, easier to remember. Uh, when we get these long, drawn-out policies, um, you really don't sometimes know where they're going with it, and they're they're difficult to remember. Um, so, you know, where do you find that balance? Is is what I'm trying to strike as a uh, you know while while I'm running the unit, I'm trying to find that balance. Um, I think we can we can find a, a policy that improves how our officers interact with the public. Um, uh, I'm already seeing a difference um, uh, with our officers now. I watched a a sergeant who got shot last week rendering aid to the person who shot him. Um, So I'm seeing really positive changes. Um, But like you, I'm also seeing a lot of the bad too. And we're working diligently to, to address that. Uh, in policy and outside of policy, you know, with our day, day-to-day operations. So I do appreciate everything being said tonight, and I've taken copious notes to remind me of it all, and I will be reading uh, Camden's uh, policy as well. Elaine Maestas. If, excuse me, uh, Chair Levis, if before yes, we are on the subject, if I could... Uh, uh, you know, piggyback on what uh, Member Galloway and uh, Commander Evans said. There has been uh, an effort, I think, on the part of the uh, policy review unit to look for, you know, some of these duplications and try not, you know, and, and walk that line between uh, having information available and having it be confusing because it isn't quite consistent from policy to policy. And so there is I think the policy review unit has actually, you know, has done a has done a good job in streamlining the the development process, trying to find some of these, uh, and uh, actually uh, creating a more of a template for some of the policies. So I think, you know, there's there's an effort, you know, there's lots of efforts being made to do lots of different things at the same time, but and sometimes they don't always quite work together. But I think there is, you know, there's some uh, there's some progress out of this chaos and. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I, I think this has been a good discussion. I'll stop there. So, um, so I'm, go ahead. I'm done. Thank you. Uh, yes, Elaine Majestas. Yeah. So I just, um, wanted to add, um, that we noticed that the word officer was replaced with sworn personnel and we appreciate that. However, it's left in um, a particular paragraph. It's in uh, 252 and it's uh, item six and it's A7. Um, and it says, and so it's left when, a fe- when feasible, a officer instead of sworn personnel observes another officer um, using force that is unreasonable, unreasonable or using force that a reasonable officer would view out of policy. So we would just, uh, like, we believe that it's equally important that this um, statement also includes sworn personnel um, to be added, not just leaving that as officer, as we would hope that, you know, a sworn, that sworn personnel would also um, be required to report out of policy use of force. Thank you. Um, uh, are there other comments here from board members or panelists, attendees? Uh, I wanted to make one brief comment or, or statement on the on the balance that uh, Acting Commander Evans spoke about with with regards to revising some of these policies and and removing some language that may be duplicated in other policies. And uh, I I think that we have to be cognizant of that, that fine line. And I, you know, I can certainly see where where each side of of this argument is coming from, but I think that, uh, you know, we have to be cognizant that a, that a 20 or 30 page policy that, that also contains the same language that's contained in another policy that we're asking uh, sworn personnel to, utilize uh, creates not only just a, a, the, the physical demands of, of being up to date with that. And I, you know, I can tell you that these policies, not necessarily these ones individually, but policies in general, and there are hundreds of them are being revised constantly. 
So I think we have to be aware of the fact that um, that language needs to be used. And so it needs to be in the most usable form, in the most trainable form, in the most easily understandable form. Um, for some of these really, you know, every policy is important, but these are clearly of the most important policies in the department. Uh, certainly that warrants some special consideration for where that line is, what should be removed versus, you know, what's okay to duplicate here because it's important to say. But, um, you know, it's, it's just a statement that I think, you know, we've, we've got to realize there's a, there's a fine line there. And I think that when a policy becomes too large and there's too much duplication, uh, I, I certainly see where you can make that less usable and, and uh, actually have the opposite effect, perhaps, of, of what you're trying to do. If you're trying to train a policy and uh, get full compliance with the policy, uh, it, it does seem that something of the more simple nature is, is going to be the, the most likely to result in that positive outcome. So uh, I think there's, there's a balance to be struck there, and I'm, I'm not sure that this meets that, but, but I think, you know, that that's something that has to be recognized. Uh, that's my, my piece on that. Is there, are there other folks wishing to be recognized? I see um, Attorney Cronin again with a hand raised, if that's current. Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the dilemma. Um, I've written policies before, and I, I understand that dilemma that you guys face. But let me also say that repetition sometimes drives the policy or whatever's being repeated home, it may emphasize the importance of it. And the more you hear it, perhaps the more you understand it and, and incorporate it into one's understanding of the way things should be followed. So that's just on the other hand, I appreciate the dilemma you guys are looking at, especially you, Commander. Um, so. Thank you, Mr. Cronin. Uh, Dr. Cass. Yeah, so I I would like to um, you know uh, also point out the uh, the sort of the training aspect and how do we how do we get training information um, fed back in into the uh, into the policies and so I when when I was preparing this I uh, let me get back to this complicated slide uh, but if you look down here there is a there is you know sort of a I've got a box for you know. You know, this is really the policy modification or, or the training modification that you occur that could occur if we had the if we got the data to the right place, and and so it turns out that training actually has uh, this SOP three thirty four creates a a training uh, committee which is composed of several different uh, unit representatives who are in and the intent is to incorporate information that they uh, gather from their actions within a particular unit and, and bring that to the attention of the training academy and then incorporate you know, their findings into changes into the training academy. Uh, I know that they won't, uh, I've been to one of those meetings, I invited myself and I got accepted. And uh, I know that that was, it seems like a, a very useful function uh, to have so that you know the the um, the policy is you know at, at at that point you can introduce the idea of whether this the policy that is written is being followed or not followed because of its um, its ability to be trained and whether and its understandability but understandability uh, you know ultimately results in how well you can learn it when you're you know when you're being trained to it and then of course how well you retain that when you actually want to uh, apply it but I think that. You know, there needs to be more attention, more formal attention given to incorporating this training information, training uh, or results from a policy application into the training, and then uh, uh, seeing whether that needs to result in a policy modification as well. So, uh, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, the policy and the training are almost inseparable at some point. Uh, you don't really have a good policy unless you, unless it's, unless it can be trained and used. So I'm, I'm making a plug for trying to you know, do a more formal uh, 
uh, placement of training uh, within, you know, policy evaluation. I just wanted to say, Dr. Cass, uh, based on our last meeting that I had with you, uh, I've been looking into that, and I think uh, in the future you're going to be happy with some of the results we're coming up with. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I know this is something, uh, Member Galloway mentioned at our last board meeting that she's interested in uh, particular in looking at training. And I think it, this is, you know, this is an area that, you know, from the standpoint of our board has not been as visible as say the policy development area. And I think it, and because I think it's, it's almost as, is it maybe, it's hard to say which is more important, but I think they're both important. And I think, we ought to, you know, have insight into both of those processes. So thank you. I you know. You know, the other another comment I'd like to make is that I, uh, given that you know the state we're in, I'd like to point out, you know, I mean, we tend to focus on the deficiencies in a, in a process or in a policy, but I think that there's also been a lot of progress in terms of of cooperative effort uh, be, in, between the community. Uh, in, and the board and APD and actually getting uh, getting better policies, getting better relationships between APD and and, uh, and the community. And we, uh, you know, we we always say, well, we've got a long ways to go. That's true, but we have come some distance. And I can, you know, I can. I've been on this board for a little bit more than four years, and I've seen, you know, what uh, three different chiefs, a couple different uh, city administrations. Uh, a whole lot of other turnover in other areas. And the, those are, you know, but, you know, bumps in the road and all, we have made some progress, so. Uh, looking for any hands raised here or folks wishing to further participate in the discussion here. Obviously, this isn't the, the end of the road here. These policies are continuously being reviewed and, and updated and, uh, you know, reiterated through this process that Dr. Cass has, has outlined and can often be a confusing process, but um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's designed that way for a reason. And so, you know, this isn't the end of the road for your participation. If you're looking to participate, the, the link has been shared uh, to submit written comments to APD on, on this pol these policies or any policy. So, uh, you know, make sure that you're aware of that. If, if you have more to add or, or something comes up later, uh, that, uh, that was just shared again by Director Harness in the, in the chat as well. Um, so, you know, one last look here if there's anybody that's, that's got further comments on this. Appreciate all the, the discussion and everyone that's uh, joined in tonight on, on this.